Let's open our Bibles to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, I hope, and we were there this morning, and every time you turn there, I hope that you think of it as it is. It's a little snapshot that Jesus gave us of what the earth looks like as he's returning. It's kind of like one of those uh, pictures that people have hanging on their wall of their business from the air or their house from the air, so you can see everything. A lot of people like that to see all that they have and they buy them from the aerial photographers, and they put them on the wall. Matthew 24 is an aerial photograph. It's, it's what it looks like on the earth as Jesus is returning. It's one of the most unique chapters in the Bible, especially when it comes to prophecy, because Jesus actually preached the sermon. And uh, it was at the uh, instigation of the disciples who said, could you please fill us in, when are you coming back? And he just waited for that and, and gave it to him, and it's wonderful. But that snapshot is really interesting because of verse 3. It says he sat, Matthew 24 and verse 3, on the Mount of Olives. And if you know anything about the Mount of Olives, as you sit there, the city of Jerusalem is just right in front of you. It's like the most panoramic, beautiful spot, a mountain covered with olive trees and looking at, at Jerusalem. The disciples came to him privately. They wanted a private briefing. They weren't going to let the crowds in on this. And they said, tell us. When will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming? And you can add the sign of the end of the age. And and that's this whole end of days study we're doing on Sunday nights is, is precipitated from this. Jesus wanted us to know what the signs would be of the end of the age. Well, as Jesus proceeds through the answer, he gives them something amazing. Remember, he could see this happening. And look what he says in verses 15 and 16. Because Jesus is, is looking into the future, and he sees a future Antichrist defiling the temple. And it says in verse 15, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, Standing in the holy place, whoever reads this, let him understand, verse 16, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now just stop for a moment. What value would that be to us? I mean, we're not Jews. We're not going to live here in the tribulation. We're not going to be in Jerusalem. And, and what, is, what would the benefit of verses 15 and 16 be to a New Testament church? I mean, a lot of people, this is just, this is for the Jews, this is, you know, it's really not for us. Uh, We have other things. So it's it's interesting when you look at that. But that would lead to even asking the question, is prophecy even profitable to study? Because, you know, this is obviously not directed toward us. So, So what would the benefit be? Well, that's a good way to start our time. Let's turn to probably the first New Testament epistle of Paul. I think James wrote one before this, but Paul wrote this one his first. It's uh, First and Second Thessalonians, the little tiny short five and three chapter letters. They're really tucked back there. You have to go, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, X, Romans, First, Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. There it is, First Thessalonians. So there we go, we found it. And, and go past first and go to second, because this amazed me, because as I was tracking around Christ's sermon, the Olivet Discourse that we just looked at. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, what's fascinating is the Apostle Paul references this. And, and he's in a New Testament church. And he's with a bunch of new believers. And he actually teaches them this stuff. So there has to be some profit because he found it. But, but follow along in 2 Thessalonians with me, please. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And he wrote this, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you, verse 2, not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now look at verse 5. This just riveted my attention. 
Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? Paul actually taught them about what we would call the tribulation. And he was only there a little while. In fact, if you read in the book of Acts chapter 17, he was there three Sabbath days in the synagogue. And then they ran him out of there, and so he stayed a bit longer, maybe six weeks total. And yet, if I was doing a campaign in a church of brand new Christians I just led to faith in Christ, I'm not sure that I would go through the tribulation Matthew 24 text. There's so, I mean, you have to cover Romans, you have to cover the epistles and everything else. But Paul thought it important to cover this, which is amazing. But what a line. Look at that fifth verse. Paul said, don't you remember while I was still with you, I, I covered these things, I told you these things. Paul included the teaching of biblical prophecy as part of the core of doctrine he presented to new believers. Wow, that should be encouraging to us today because we're one of the few churches that would still consider that to be important. In fact, we, we're, we've been blessed with a lot of guests this weekend. We had three, three or four couples in the morning service and went out to lunch with them, and now we're sitting with two more couples. I'm even related to some of them on the row uh, my sister's here and her husband, and, and we've just been blessed with people. And I was saying at lunch today, I said, did you know that the message you heard this morning, the people that travel in from Ann Arbor and all to, to be here, I said, do you know that that would make, if, if that was delivered in most churches, it would make a lot of people uncomfortable. Because Christianity's moved right past literally believing the Bible. We kind of pick and choose. It's like a smorgasbord, a salad bar. We take the tomatoes and the broccoli and we leave stuff we don't like and we just kind of go down the line and we put dressing over the top of it of whatever our personal persuasion is and mix it all together and say, that's what it means to me. And to take the Bible for what it says and to take it literally, the way Jesus interpreted it and believed it and taught it and held it and so did his apostles is a rare thing. So is this. Biblical prophecy is on hard times because people don't like how it turns out that the world is not going to get better, that, that we are not going to culminate our evangelism with the return of Christ. That is not what the church's purpose is. Our, our purpose is not to, to get the whole world Christianized so Jesus can finally come back. No, it's going to get dark, much darker than you think it is now. And it's going to be awful. And so that's what Paul was warning them about. And that's what he told them way back then. And what's the context? What would teaching about the Antichrist and the end of Jerusalem and the temple being rebuilt and defiled do for anyone? Well, it put it all in perspective for him. Turn back to the, the book before. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4, because this evening we're talking about the blessed hope of the believers, which is the rapture of Jesus Christ. The word rapture is not in the Bible. Don't look for it. It might be in your study Bible, but it isn't actually in the words that God breathed out through the Holy Spirit. The word that is in the Bible is the word harpazo. That's the Greek word, and, and it means to be caught up. In fact, it sounds a little bit like harpoon. You know, and it, what it means is to be snatched, to be grabbed, to be pulled out. It's kind of like if you lean over the campfire and your checkbook fell in, you'd go, whoa, you know, or worse, your iPod. You'd really go, whoa, you know, and pull it right out of there because you wouldn't want anything to happen to it if it was somewhere dangerous for its well-being. That's what the word is that we find in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And what Paul does is, Paul wrote to the Thessalonian believers after he taught them all the things in Matthew 24. He was teaching them the value of thinking about Christ's return. In fact, one of the clearest passages in God's word about Christ coming for his church is right here in this little epistle Paul wrote to these people he was with for such a short time. And that's in the fourth chapter. And in the 13th through the 18th verses, if we listen with our hearts, we can hear God tell us what his plans are for the future. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, let's stand together for the reading of God's word and remain standing for prayer, and let's let the Lord speak to us. Verse 13, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that those who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven 
with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. There's harpazo, rapture. Caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Verse 18. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Let's bow together. Father, I pray that you would comfort our hearts. You comfort our hearts that you are in control, that you are coming, that you will take us to be with you, that you will bring us to meet you in the air. And Lord, I pray that we would have that blessed hope, that assurance of your any time coming. And I pray that it would motivate us like it motivated them. The early church was so vibrant because they believed in the any moment coming of Christ. They all lived as if it was going to happen in their lifetime, as we should. Because those that were closest to the message, those that actually heard your spirit-prompted voices, the scripture writers themselves speaking and teaching and writing, and those who got this letter for the very first time, it stirred them up. And we know that the, the first meaning of your word is what you meant to those who received it. That's the primary interpretation. And so if we look at them, we find out what you meant. Because what they received was that Jesus could come today. And they lived like it. And I pray that we would believe your word enough that we would live like it too. And we ask that not by our own strength, our own um, mental prowess, but by the power of your spirit and by the energy of your grace. And we ask for that now for your glory. In your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. As you're seated, I'm glad they got confused. You know, he says, don't don't think that you miss the Lord's coming because, and he explained it in 2 Thessalonians 2, that means that biblical prophecy has always been challenging. It has always precipitated and elicited responses from people, and they get a little mixed up and confused and troubled. And so it's okay. And that's why one of the the definite teachings of the Scripture about prophecy is we're not supposed to be dogmatic about prophecy. Prophecy should induce forbearance. You know what forbearance is? It's how you treat your best friend's kids. You don't correct them and and harp on all their mistakes. You love their parents so much that you, you have forbearance. The first thing that prophecy should do is induce forbearance with us. There are other brothers and sisters in Christ that don't quite see it as clearly as we might, or we might not see it as clearly as they do, and we should be forbearing of one another in Christ. And secondly, biblical prophecy should rebuke dogmatism. The Bible does not say be dogmatic about your particular complete grasp as if we know all things and and have put it all together. The interesting thing is that there's no passage in Scripture that it's all put together. That's only in the back of your study Bible in those charts. It's not that way in the Bible. Biblical prophecy is only achieved and arrived at by a long time study and a long time gathering and prayerful look at the Scriptures. And finally, biblical prophecy not only should induce forbearance or rebuke dogmatism, it should also provoke inquiry. That means every time I hear something, I remember I was invited to a meal once uh, out in California, and it was with Bob Van Camp and used to own Xerox and the Van Camp and Merit Fund, a lot of other things. Very wealthy, wealthy man. In fact, he lived around here in Chicago and then moved up along the shore of Lake Michigan. But he had spent 2,000 hours, that's one whole work year, 40 hours a week for 50 weeks, studying prophecy, and he wrote down his findings. And his findings were called the pre-wrath rapture of the church and that was his finding so i was at this meal in the 80s and and uh with a whole bunch of professors and of course with dr MacArthur, and he presented his study and he said this is it and john said "Mm." he says many men have studied scriptures for many years and he said i i appreciate your hard work he said no this is it and john said well many men have studied scripture for many years and we all come to conclusions and and i appreciate your work but you understand A lot of people, it has to be their way. And what we have to do is we have to, when we read or hear or see something that we don't know, it should should provoke us to inquire and look at what they said and, and try and understand how they got to that and understand where they came and to look at what they say. And so what you hear tonight, I hope that instead of just going home and tucking your Bible and saying, that's it, 
It should cause you to go back like the Bereans did in Acts 17.11 and to check out the Scriptures. We should always be inquiring in the Scriptures. Well, remember the first law of interpreting the Bible is that there's only one interpretation that's right for each passage. There are not 12. There are not 10. As the new emerging church idea is that there are many different interpretations and you just pick yours and yours is good and mine is good and we'll just all be happy. No, no. There's one. God only meant one thing for each passage. It's the message God was giving by his spirit through his word for those that got the letter or the paragraph or the message or the prophecy. There is one interpretation, but there are many applications. Now, some people mix up application and interpretation. Interpretation is the message, the content of the message that God intended to be communicated. Application is what you do with it not what it means what you do with it how you fulfill it how you obey remember jesus said he that hath my commandments and keepeth them interpretation is what are his commandments keeping them is the application how that applies in my life in my obedience so there are many ways we can obey the word of god but god has one interpretation the interpretation is often easy to understand as we see what reaction was among those early believers who got the message in the first place. And, and that's one of the most fascinating things in study. And instead of having a Bible study where you say, well, to me this means, what's interesting to do is to say, what did God communicate to them? And how did they respond to the Word of God? When that letter was read to them, when that prophecy was given to them, what was their response? And there's a great learning in that. Well, what did the teachings of Paul do for the early believers? How did they respond to him? What did those who received the message of God through Paul think that he meant? If you've ever read what the New Testament believers did after, as, as we're just poking through right now, it's very clear what the interpretation should be of these passages. They believed in Christ any moment coming. That's what, in fact, they, they thought they'd missed it. They thought he'd already come. That's how any moment it could be. Second Thessalonians 2, 1 through 5 was Paul saying, no, 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 he hasn't come yet. No, 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 no. This is yet to come and there's going to be all the falling away and there's going to be, and he was talking about the second coming. But see, they, they thought that they were already in that horrible time of the tribulation. They thought they missed the any moment coming of Christ to take his church before the wrath that it says, in Second Thessalonians 3, as he says, we're kept from the hour. Well, they believed in Christ any moment coming. And because they believed that, here's the essence. They didn't put charts up and they didn't, they didn't argue over their view and who was going to have 666 and where they were going to tattoo it. They didn't, I mean, those are modern things. You know what they did? They lived differently. And see, the essence of, of biblical prophecy is not to argue. It's to live differently. It's to live expectantly. It's to have your bags packed and be ready to go at any moment, but yet still fulfill what we're called to do. Well, for just a moment, I want to introduce you to the Thessalonian believers of century one, because not only do we have this biblical record, but we also have the archaeological record. And that record was uncovered at the end of the 19th century. And I just want to briefly tell you about it. The ancient city of Thessalonica was an honored city in the Roman Empire. So archaeologists at the turn of the last century wanted to find the Thessalonica of the Roman period, of the first century, of Paul's day. And so all that's left of the city above ground today is one archway. In fact, if you go to Saloniki, it's the second largest city in Greece today. Athens, Saloniki is number two. If you go there today, all that's left is one archway. You know, it's kind of disappointing. And so slowly the archaeologists have been clearing back the rubble. In fact, the last time we were there, we... Starbucks, right across from the Ignatian Way. And you could actually see the ancient highway that Paul came into town on. And so Bonnie and I were drinking our coffee and gaining weight, looking at the Ignatian Way and, and reading the Scriptures. So they're really working hard at that. But the most significant thing they found was really in the late uh, 19th century, a group of French archaeologists started their mapping and exploration of the ancient boundaries of the Roman city. And those French archaeologists actually took the Thessalonian dig. They said, we want to do this. And so they funded it and they staked it out as archaeologists do and they began to carefully peel back the layers. 
And as they peel back the layers, you know how archaeologists are. They never know what's down there, so you can't come in with a bulldozer. You have to, they even use brushes. And they were just working, and all the people were hauling the dirt out. And all of a sudden, someone went, we found something. They stopped the work, and the chief archaeologist, archaeologist came out from under the tent with his brush, and he looked, and he said, yes, we found something. And so they started clearing, and they took away the dirt. And what they had found is they were actually in a cemetery. And they found a, a big slab with engraving on it and so they carefully got it out of the dirt and they lifted it up and they brushed it all off and they brought it under the tent and there was the archaeologist and he put his spectacles on and he looked and he says, oh, Greek word on here, amemptos. He said, obviously, someone by the name of amemptos was buried here. And so they put it in the charts and they moved it into the storage part of the tent and they went back to work. And they started working, working, working. By the way, that they were in a cemetery is significant. Did you know there were no cemeteries before Christ? Did you ever think of that? Koimeo, the Greek word, means to sleep. A koimeto place is called a cemetery. A cemetery is where bodies sleep. Before Christ, they didn't have cemeteries. They had necropoli, cities of dead people. In fact, if you go around the ancient world, there are what are called a necropolis, a dead people city, polis city, necro dead, dead city. That's, that's where they put bodies. But after Christ, because Jesus says that, that they, remember, he says, don't worry about Lazarus, he sleeps. Remember this idea? And they, they said, oh, you don't know, he's really sleeping, he's dead, you know. And, and Paul says those that sleep in Jesus, there's this whole idea of sleep, of awaiting the resurrection, of not being dead, but being alive in Christ and the body sleeping and waiting to be resurrected. And that's what the church picked up. And so they didn't bury their people in the necropolis. They took the believers and started their own little area and they called it a cemetery as a testimony to the world. They were awaiting the resurrection. And that's why they even position them so when they sit up, they're looking eastward you know, to, for Christ's return and all that. So the archaeologists kept working. And all of a sudden, later in the day, they had another, oh, another find. So he went over there, and they brushed away the dirt. Oh, it's another slab. And so they picked it up, and they cleaned it off, and they put it in the tent. And as soon as they cleaned it off, he went, oh, a memtas. Interesting. There are a lot of these people in this town by that name. And they did the whole cemetery, and guess what was on all of the tombstones? A memtas. Now, I want you to think about that, because it's right here in First Thessalonians. Look at chapter 3, verse 13. The archaeologist said, that's interesting, Amemtas lived here. But what they didn't know was, if they would have just looked into the Scriptures and read it in the Koine Greek of the New Testament world, they would have found out. In 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 13, the Apostle Paul challenged them. This is right in the middle of the epistle, and he says, so that he may establish your hearts, and right there it is, Amemtas. might be in New King James, it says blameless. Yours might say blameless or unblameable or something like that. That's the word amemtas. Now, it's a very interesting word. What it means is uh, nothing hindering you from, from using it. It's, it's kind of an interesting word. It's almost like um, that, that you look in your closet, and if you're going somewhere special, you don't pick the one that still has spaghetti sauce on it. You should have sent it to the cleaners. You pick something that's amemtas, that is completely ready to go at any moment that you can use and, and so Paul says, I want you, the Lord, to establish your hearts unblameable or blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints. What he said was, I want you to be ready at any moment to go. I want you to be ready at any moment to be ready, to be, as, as Jesus said, the church, remember the, the church in Laodicea, that they were neither hot nor cold, they were lukewarm. They weren't ready. They were just kind of just floating along. He said, I wish you were cold so I could chasten you and jerk you back on the road. I wish you were hot and fervently seeking me, but you're neither. You're just, you're just, you're not ready. Amemtas. Amemtas means I'm ready. My heart is hot. I'm not cold or lukewarm. I'm hot and ready for Christ's coming. I will never have to answer to God for my sins if I'm in Jesus. I will never be judged for my sins if I'm in Jesus. I will never be condemned for my sins because I'm in Jesus. I will never have to pay for my sins because of Christ. You know, every time I, I drive around, there's a little, uh, I don't even remember which one it is, but there's a little pizza place that's it's not only in Oklahoma, it's here too because I've seen it. And they have this little sign they put out. You know what it says? Hot and ready. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to heaven. 
What it means is that they are prepared for your coming at any moment. They won't go, oh, we got to make a pizza. You just showed up. They're ready all the time. What they mean is that their ovens are hot and their pizza is ready for you to come. And whenever I see the hot and ready pizza signs, I think of the Thessalonian believers, that concept that they were amemtas, they couldn't forget that their sins were gone, that they could stand before God unblameable. They were unashamed of their sinful lives they had lived before Christ. What kind of lives had they lived? Well, look at, back at the beginning. Look at 1 Thessalonians. This is a beautiful little letter. Look at verse 9 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. The last two, two, two verses. By the way, the Thessalonian epistles, 1 Thessalonians, every chapter ends with a reference to the return of Christ. The last two verses of chapter 1, uh, the last uh, three verses of chapter 2, the last verse of chapter 3, uh, all those verses we just read in chapter 4 and in chapter 5, verse 23. Every chapter had as a part of its makeup the coming of Christ. But look at chapter 1, verse 9. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, how you turned to God from idols. They turned to God. They embraced Him. But they turned to God from something. Do you know that the Bible demonstrates kind of a, a picture of repentance, that in repentance we turn from something to something. Now, repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of behavior. But that change of mind is away from a certain displeasing to God's sin and toward a certain pleasing God response. So, number one, they embraced Him. They turned to God from idols. Secondly, they served Christ. They served the living and true God. And, and verse 10, they waited for. Uh, they, they embraced Him, they served Him, and they longed for Him. You see, your and my desire for Christ's return is how much we love Him, how much we long for Him. At one of the more foolish things I ever did in my life, I agreed in 1983 to lead a group of people on a 90-day, uh, 36-country tour around the world. It was in the old days when you could buy these tickets, and if you went east or west, it was one price, and you could stop as many times as you wanted on the airlines. It was a neat deal. And so uh, in my silliness, I said, okay, I'll, I'll take you around the lecture and go. And so we set off on this 90-some-day tour, and about two months after I agreed to do this, I met my wife-to-be. And did you know, for 12,000 miles, I was flying away from her on that trip. It was the hardest thing in the world. And then, for the next 12,000, I was flying toward her, and it was hard for the people on the trip because I couldn't wait. I said, let's, who wants to stay in India any longer? Let's get out of here. <laughs> you know, let's get out of China. Who wants to be in China? Uh, you know, let's get out of here. And, and we were in all these islands and the most beautiful wonders of the world. I said, let's get out of here. I want to get home. You know why? Because, look what it says, to wait for His Son. We have a longing for those we love, and we can't wait to be with them, to be near them, to be where they are. Did you know that love is what the early church had? They truly they didn't have to sing, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. They felt it. They felt not at home here. They called themselves pilgrims and strangers here. Peter says we live in a tent. He says life is camping, heaven is home. And, and you know the feeling if you've ever been gritty and grimy and sleeping on the ground in the cold and the dampness of camping and you can't wait to get home to what you really, really love. And that's what these people were possessed with. They, verse 10, were waiting for His Son from heaven who raised from the dead even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. They trusted Him. I love their testimony. In verse 9, they turned to Him. That means they embraced what He said and they served Him and they, they longed for Him. Verse 10, they were waiting for Him and they trusted Him because He delivered them. Well, that's how the early church was. But look back at verse 13 again of chapter 3, the ending verse there. It says, So that He may establish your hearts blameless in holiness. What they said is, My past is paid for but my present should be consecrated to Him. I want, and, and what they did is, and how they lived, and, and what the blessed hope of the believers were, was not that they sat on their rooftops aimlessly unemployed waiting for Christ to return. No, they realized that 
he was going to come and get them, and they didn't have to, you know, go on the rooftop and quit their job and go and wait for him. They were supposed to be serving him with all their heart and, and not to worry because he was going to grab them when it was time and snatch them out of this world. And so they had this enthusiastic excitement about Christ, this longing for him as they were a slave or as they were a senator, or as they were a businessman, or as they were a soldier, or as they were a missionary like Paul, they had this consuming, passionate longing for Christ. But verse 13 says that they were allowing the Lord to consecrate their present life so that, they, so that your hearts may be established blameless in holiness. Holiness is living with righteous conduct. Now, now we in our own strength can't do that. But they realized that the one that saved them was going to keep them. And they knew that the grace of God would teach them to live this way. So with that in mind, I want to conclude this this little look at the rapture by showing you what I believe is one of the most beautiful little lists of, of, of words that Paul gave them. Now remember, the context of the New Testament is this. These people did not have Christian bookstores. They did not have Zondervan family bookstores where they have thousands of books. They did not have tapes. They did not have MP3s. They did not have Christian radio. They did not have computers where they could be constantly, endlessly printing off all this stuff. They just were working people. Most of the church were slaves in the old days. And those slaves would come to evening meetings. That's why they met at night. They didn't meet at night so they could play around water ski all day. They they met at night because they worked all day and they met at night. And that's why I remember Eutychus fell out of the window. Now, you know why his name was Eutychus, because Eutychus too, if you'd have fallen out out the window. But (laughs) you see the old my evangelist days come out. You have to watch out. I'll slip those up on you. Just like Acts 29. Did I catch you last week? That was a good one. I always remember that one. But uh, that's why Eutychus fell out of the window because they, those people worked all day. They were dead tired, but they didn't want to miss the teaching of the Word of God because they didn't have all these options that we have. And what they did is they intently listened and, and they tried to, to remember the Word of God, maybe write something down. And so what Paul did, especially in the Thessalonian epistle, is he distilled down this any moment coming of Christ lifestyle into something they could easily remember. And let me just show you what I mean. Because he taught them in that city, and what he taught them in that city, and what caused them to have in their cemetery every single gravestone from the first century era with this amemtas, this hot and ready, you know, little engravature on their their headstone. The reason they had that is because Paul was, he had reduced down, he said that the life Christ wants you to have is constituted by this this desire to wherever he finds me, whenever he comes, I want to be pleasing in his sight. Now, I know I'm a sinner, but my sins are forgiven. And so because I don't have that burden of guilt, I want him to, to empower me to live in a way that pleases him. And so, in verse 10, look at this. Here's the first one of chapter 1, verse 10. And I'm going to give you these. I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Well, I won't do all of them. But we'll just get started on them, okay? What he said is this. We, we have a new conduct that's expected by our God. They weren't ashamed of their past. Remember verse 9? They were former idolaters because they knew it was covered by the blood of Christ. They weren't ashamed of their present conduct because they knew that the way they lived their life was without condemnation in the sight of God when they were operating in the Spirit. And so what he says in verse 10 is, he says, you have a new goal. He says, your new goal is to wait for his Son from heaven. Wait for the Son. Now, when I used to live in California, uh, and, and any of you that have never lived out there, I don't know if they have it here, but in Los Angeles, they have six-lane roads, and they have these little bus stops. And I forget even what the name of the bus stop company, not MARTA, I don't remember what it is, but whatever it is in California, they had bus stops, and everybody knew that's where the bus came. And what I used to love is I would be zipping down with three lanes going each direction like this, and as you were going down the road, you'd see a whole bunch of people doing this. And the car... You know what they were doing? There were more of them that would fit on that bus, and so they were all looking for the bus so they could push everybody else out of the way and get on the bus. You know what I knew as I drove down the streets of Los Angeles? Do you know what I knew those people were doing? Waiting for what? The bus. 
Everything in their body, everything in their eyes as they leaned their heads out into the oncoming traffic and they were looking down there for the bus. You could see it written on their face. You could see it in their their whole body language. They were waiting for the bus. Look at chapter 1, verse 10. Paul says, you have a new goal. Your new goal is that everyone that sees you, everybody that knows you, everybody that works around you, everybody that's in contact with you knows that you are waiting for the Son. Now those slaves took that home. Their former goal was living for themselves, accumulating, having pleasure. Whatever your life's goal was before, Paul says, has changed now. It's not trying to see how much you can promote yourself. It's not trying to see how much you can gain power in life. It's not to see what kind of new and exciting things you can experience to travel or see or do. Here's your new goal. Wait for Jesus. Being found pleasing in His sight when He comes. Let me ask you, if the Lord came this past week and froze what you're watching on the screen of your television, just froze it right there, would you have taken the remote and gone, you know, I I was really watching TBN, Lord, I wasn't really watching that, you know, I'm sorry, you know, I, I, I really, I really wasn't watching that. How about if you froze what was on your screen of your computer? You know, one of the nice things, if you want to really, you can have all kinds of services on your computer, one of the nicest ones is turn it around so that everyone that you can't see is watching what you're watching. Don't, don't be alone with no one seeing what you're watching. Turn it around. Have your back to the audience and have them looking over your shoulder because the Lord's there. And, and what they decided is they were never going to be anywhere in the Roman Empire that would displease Christ if he found them there. As Jonathan Edwards said, they resolved to never have the last thing they were doing if Christ came for them to be something that would be displeasing in his sight. Well, that just changed their whole life. They thought about everywhere they were going because their goal was to wait for the sun. And because they were taught by Paul that Christ any moment returns should keep them on their spiritual toes, Paul distilled down the Christian life to some bite-sized pieces. These saints who had no tapes, no bookstores to catch the latest title, they had no Christian radio, they had no study Bible to use and carry around. In reality, all they had is what they heard and could remember. So Paul reduced the entire life of a believer down to some little mottos that they could hold on to. There's the first one in chapter 1, verse 10. Wait for the Son. They decided, I am waiting for Jesus. Because of Christ, any moment coming, I have a new goal in life. My goal is waiting for Jesus. Now, I'm going to work while I wait. They're kind of like Nehemiah's wall builders. They had the trowel in one hand, they had the spear in the other. They were still doing their job, but they were working for the Lord. And that's how we are to be. We are not to be idle. We, are not, we already know about that. It says that if someone isn't willing to work, they shouldn't eat. And we were supposed to to refrain from Christians who wouldn't work were disorderly and they were to be separated from. But Christians are constantly having a new goal. We're waiting for Jesus. We're like at the bus stop. We're, We're leaning out into life and we're looking for His coming and longing because we love Him. The second one, look at chapter 2, verse 12. Here's another cute, short one that you can always remember. That you would... Now look how easy it is to remember this. 1 Thessalonians 2, 12. Walk worthy of God. Boy, that distills it down. A slave could remember that. Walk speaks of your conduct in life. I want to conduct myself in life worthy of God. That's a whole new way of looking at life. That means that it's better than a WWJD bracelet. It's saying that the way I talk would be worthy as if God was talking. That the way that I respond to people would be worthy as if it was God's response. You see, the whole idea is, is what is coming out of my life measuring up to who I belong to? So they had a new plan in life. And their new plan in life in chapter 2, verse 12 is, I want to walk. I want to conduct myself worthy of God. Look at verse 13. They had a new authority in life. Previously, they were their own authority. But verse 13 says this, For this reason we thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of man, but as it is in truth, the word of God. See, he he underscored it, and he said this, you have a new authority. And your new authority is, I will take God at his word. You know, we talked about that this morning. Do you believe God enough to trust his word? To believe his word? To sit before his word and say, Lord... This is the most important part of my day. 
This, this, this is the eternal part of my day. Speak, Lord, your servant hears. And by the way, when are we supposed to read the Bible? Well, what's interesting is you can pick either way. You might begin your day in the morning. God actually begins his day in the evening. Remember in Genesis it said the evening and the morning were the first day. Some people operate better. Some of these night people, I mean, they're not even awake in the morning. They're not even awake till noon. They're at work half asleep. You know, They go through life kind of, ooh, until they kind of start coming alive in the afternoon. Then they really go at night. It could be that you're one of those in the evening is the beginning of your day. And maybe you should have the last thing you think about. You know what I do with my buddies, the the little ones that are still home, the little four? We have as the last thing we do, we shut everything else down, we pray, we talk about the Lord, so that the last thing in those little minds that are going to be just going all night long is not the Lord of the Rings or the favorite video game or some... Music sung by some unbeliever that's so totally immersed in himself and singing about things they shouldn't sing about. The last thing they think about is the Lord and His Word. And, and what Paul said to them, because of Christ any moment coming, you should say, I have a new authority. I take God at His Word. I want to listen to His voice. I want my life to have God's Word at the beginning of my day. And the beginning of your day can be at night before you go to sleep. That's how God looks at it. Your day actually started last night. We're right now starting tomorrow. It's after sunset, and we're really at the beginning of tomorrow. And so you should put a little of the Word of God in. If you're a morning person, you ought to start it in the morning. Or if you're like David, you can say evening, morning, and at noon. Okay? So it doesn't matter. Just There's no uh, law you must read at 6 a.m. like you know Hudson Taylor. No, no. Just get the Word of God. I will take God at His Word. Look at verse 14. And, and all the way through the end, I will have a new standard to measure my life. Look what he says. For you, brethren, verse 14 of chapter 2, became imitators. The Greek word there is mimites, kind of mimic we get from that Greek word. You became mimics of the churches of God which are in Judea in Christ Jesus. For you suffered the same things that they suffered. And then he talks about how bad they were. But look at verse 17. For we, but we, brethren, having been taken away from you a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more eagerly to see your face with great desire. He's talking about these believers he'd led to Christ. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. It's very interesting. That Greek word means that he blockaded the road. It's the same word when the Roman legions were going and the enemies would roll boulders down and try and stop their marching. Did you know Satan hinders us? Sometimes you think your car just didn't start. Sometimes you think that your computer, you know, or the printer won't work. Did you know Satan's in a constant hindrance mode? He just likes to hinder anything that's going forward for the Lord. But that's not the message. Look at verse 19. Here it is. For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? What is it that I say is the pinnacle of my life? You know, a couple of weeks ago, we were at St. Andrews, you know, the birthplace of golf. And the man that took us around, the pastor, he says, I've my whole life always wanted to play this course. I said, I mean, that's your greatest. Oh, no, he said, that's not my greatest desire. It's my greatest desire is the Lord. But he says, it would be fun to play this course. I said, oh, good, let's tune that up. I said, we don't want to have the wrong greatest desire in life. But do you know what some people have as their crown of rejoicing? It's a car, or it's a boat, or it's a house or it's a position, or it's a possession, or it's an amount of money. You know what Paul said? I have a whole new standard I measure my life by. What is my hope? What is my joy? What brings me joy? What is the crown of rejoicing? The the greatest, it's going to be the crowning event of my life. What is it? I have a whole new standard. He says, I will measure each choice in my life. Look at what it says there, by Christ's coming. Is it not even you, verse 19, in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming. You are our glory and joy. What he said is, I'm going to measure my life by Christ's return. And I'm going to say, what will matter at Christ's return is what I'm going to live for. I have a whole new standard. I have a whole new paradigm. I have a whole new way of measuring my life. And I measure my life not by how much it benefits me, but how much it benefits God. Not by how much it will profit me, but how much it will last for eternity. And you know what the only thing we can take with us to heaven You know what the only thing is we can take to heaven? People. You can send your money and prayers ahead, but you can only take people with you. And Paul says, you, individuals, you, people, 
you, verse 20, you that I led to Christ, that I nurtured, that I discipled, that I was a part of your spiritual life, that I prayed for, and I still pray for, that I taught, that I, I'm still teaching, whatever relationship they had, you are our glory and joy. Because of Christ, any moment coming, I have a whole new standard. Verse 19 and 20 say, I will measure my choices in my life by Christ's coming. What's going to matter at His coming? What will please Him? What will last forever? What will not burn as it goes across the fire? 1 Corinthians 3, 13 through 15. What will, what will be gold and silver and precious stones in His sight? I have a whole new standard. Real quickly, look at verses 3 and 4 of chapter 3. He says, I have a whole new perspective. I will accept suffering from God. He says uh, in verse 3, No one should be shaken by afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are appointed to these. In fact, we told you this before, verse 4, when we were with you, that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened and you know. You know what he says? I have a whole new perspective. I'm going to accept suffering from God. When I went to Michigan State University and one time raised my hand and said to the teacher, the professor, I had two of them, two real anti-Christian professors there. And I just raised my hand and I said, you know what? You are mocking the Bible and I believe it's true. I mean, I don't know what they're going to do. Throw their cigarette at me or something. And you know what? They didn't respond. They just looked at me mockingly. But you know what? We are supposed to expect that. Now, we don't... We don't belligerently go out and push people and say, stop sinning and come to Christ. It's not, we don't, we don't elicit persecution. But our lives, look, look what he says. I told you before, verse 4, that we would suffer. In fact, he told Timothy, yea, all that are godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer. If you're not suffering, maybe people don't know you're godly. Maybe you're hiding too well under the bushel, your, your light, and it's not making them feel bad. Look at verse 12. We have a new resource. We go through life. Uh, and that new resource is chapter 3, verse 12. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love. You know what our new resource is? Love. You know what makes me let people uh, you know, uh, pull out in front of me? You know what makes me slow down when I know someone is doing something dumb? Do you know what it is? It's not human. I don't like that. I used to be a truck driver. I would run them off the road. I mean, that's how it used to be in the Michigan roads in the 70s, but I'm not that way. You know, uh, you get sanctified the longer you live. You know what? Love prompts us to a different response. We have a whole new resource, and that resource is I can abound in love. And that's what verse 12 said. No slaves, when they had masters that were mistreating them, when they had masters that were unreasonable, do you know what they could do? They could either get angry and rebel and have stress and heart problems and everything else, or they could have a new resource. They could abound in love. Jesus said, love your enemies. Pray for those that despitefully use you. And rejoice that you can suffer for Christ. And if they ask you for your coat, give them your shirt too. Oh, we've changed. If someone asks me for my coat, I'm going to sue them for their shirt. That's how we operate in America. I mean, we are the most uh, litigating society there is because, you know why we do that? Because we measure life how it helps me. And if I can sue your socks off and get a big settlement, it's going to help me. And Christ said, you're supposed to measure life what's going to help him. Usually, you can't share the gospel with someone that you have totally defeated in court. They usually won't listen to you talk about how much Jesus loves you and them and how the, you have the fruit of the Spirit. They don't like that. And so Paul said, when the soldier comes and says, carry my backpack, you say, hey, I'll carry it two miles. The law says, I carry it one, I'll carry it two. See, the Christians were different. And we need to re-examine how they understood Christianity. Because we've kind of put it through a grid of the 20, 20th and 21st century. America, actually. It's, they aren't even like this in other countries. It's pretty American, this, this me-first kind of stuff that, that just permeates our materialism. Well, one more. Uh, verse 3, and, and we will pick up here later. 1 Thessalonians 4.3. Here's the last one. Because of Christ's any moment return, I have a new, a new appetite in life. I have an appetite to stay 
pure. See what he says in verse 3? For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. That means emotional immorality, mental immorality, and physical immorality. Some people have never committed adultery in their life. They just treat someone else like they're married to them emotionally. Some people have never committed physical immorality with anyone in their life, but they sure have thought about it a lot. You know, see, we have a lot of paper and, and, and uh, electronic concubines out there. We have a lot, a, a lot of, of imaginations and that also the emotional side. But it is not just... Remember, Jesus said that if you look on a woman, you don't touch her, you look on her to commit adultery, he says you're an adulterer. Jesus had quite a high standard. And so, you know what Paul said to these people? Remember I told you that all the people in the gym were out there running around with no clothes on? You know what he said? This is the will of God that you abstain from anything that would lead you to sexual immorality. That means you put a block on your cable and and make it PG so it's not 13 or above. So you can't even see all that stuff. And you put a a block and you turn your computer around and you just say, "Uh, would you help me? I don't want to go to these things that will expose me to nudity, that will lower my threshold. Remember I told you this, this oxymoron of the English language, partial nudity? That's kind of like a, a, you know, a healthy, you know, fast food or something like that. You, they, are, they are mutually exclusive. You cannot have partial and nudity. It's just, t- just say it's nudity. And God says Christians don't look at nudity. Partial, whole, or not. This, see, the most mentioned sin in the New Testament is sexual sin. It's at the top of every list. And we're no different. He said, I have a new appetite in life. My old appetite was self-pleasing, immorality, of these people that live for their flesh. And he said, this is the will of God, your sanctification. Stay pure. Boy, the slaves got that. And they said, I have a new appetite. It's not for self-gratification. It's for God-gratification. And I hope because of Christ, any moment return, that's what we'll start cultivating in our lives too. Let's all stand for a word of prayer. And as you stand... I want to remind you, we have a new goal. I'm waiting for Jesus. We have a new plan. I'm going to walk worthy of God. I have a new authority. I'm going to take God at His Word. I have a new standard. I'm going to measure every choice in my life by Christ's coming. And I have a new perspective. Suffering, I'm going to accept from God. I have a new resource to make it through life. I can abound in love. And I have a brand new appetite. I want to stay pure. Well, I thought tonight the best way we could close is put my brother-in-law on the spot. So, Steve, start walking this way. I'm going to let you close in prayer. My own brother-in-law is here. He spirited my sister away many years ago and married her. And he's a faithful pastor. And if you're ever in the east side of the state, uh, he pastors in Langsburg, Michigan. And uh, he's a wonderful Bible teacher and evangelist. Come on up here. Oh, boy, we don't even have microphones up here. Or does this? No? Yeah, we do. Does this work? Hello. Steve, come on up here. This is my brother-in-law, Pastor Brown. There you go. Close this in prayer, my brother. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just are so thrilled tonight to have your word open to us. We know that your Holy Spirit is working in our hearts and our souls, driving the truths of your word into our lives And Lord, may we go out of here this evening thinking about a memtas, thinking about being blameless in a world that thinks there's no such thing as being blameless, thinking about in a world that's impure, being pure. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for loving us, for sending your Son to die for us. And I pray that tonight you would send us out from this place, not the same as we came in, but totally changed by your word, by your Holy Spirit, guiding and directing us even to a lost soul that we might point the way to Jesus Christ and they might be gloriously saved. Thank you for the word tonight. Thank you for this church. I ask your blessing upon it in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessing upon it in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessing upon it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
blessing upon it. In Jesus' name, amen.